I'm getting very displeased with how people are pushing their agendas into our entertainment. I mean, come on, Disney. Pushing your sinful and godless lifestyles into your films? Come on, man. Zootopia. Beauty and the Beast. Furries. I'm not taking my child to see a furry film, you sick perverted. You know, Disney wasn't always on top of the world, no matter how weird that fact would seem. People older than, say, 35 know about this, but during the 70s and especially the 80s, Disney was in a rut when it came to their theatrically released movies. A rut of commercial and critical disappointments, to be precise. As people deemed the Black Cauldron as the absolute lowest point of Disney at this time, it wasn't until a few years after the releases of The Great Mouse Detective and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and The Little Mermaid especially, that kickstarted a new era of Disney films and a slew of beloved stories and faces that would impact a generation of people. I know that because I was that generation of people. And I've been among my peers. Look! You would never be able to guess that I have been to Disney World. What would later be dubbed as the Disney Renaissance was in full effect in the second film in this lineup, the second one that a majority of people remember in this lineup was Beauty and the Beast. Okay, stop me if you heard this one. Belle is a young woman living in a French village with her single father. After her father gets imprisoned by the titular Beast whilst looking for shelter in a wayward path in a storm, Belle ventures to the castle and pleads to the Beast to have him trade places with herself and her dad. The Beast, having spent years in the castle after an enchantress turned him into a monster for being unkind, furiously agrees, while the castle's servants, who are transformed into various furniture inside the estate, bring up the idea that a relationship could prosper between them, ultimately breaking the spell that is currently clocking down to an eternity of of inhumanness for the castle's peoples. All the while, Zap Brannigan, who is determined to have Belle as his bride, plans to have her for good, even if he has to ostracize the beast to do it. For a setup like that, the film attempts to take its time in letting the characters do their thing for a majority of the film's middle. Beauty and the Beast is a good film if you care about these characters specifically and their situation at hand, and I think the fans of this movie do, and a lot of critics do as well. You know, for the 90s, Belle is pretty progressive. She is shown to be more literate and interested in the world around her and its ideas and happenstances rather than just getting a guy to smooch, ambitions that would be unorthodox in her day. How can you read this? There's no pictures. Well, some people use their imagination. Belle? It's about time you got your head out of those books and paid attention to more important things. Like me. It's not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking. Jeez. <laughs> uh, I know that was supposed to be taken as a joke to prove how awful Gaston is, but I've taken so many liberal arts classes in college and even I wasn't prepared for that. Oh my god, that's so sexist! She also doesn't put up with anybody either, be it Johnny Bravo's chauvinistic attitude or the Beast's tantrums. That hurts! If you'd hold still, it wouldn't hurt as much. Well, if you hadn't have run away, this wouldn't have happened. The Beast, while proven to be a bit of a jerk at the beginning, also is an interesting character. Him being a monstrous creature with a furious roar slowly transforming to be more self-composed and considerate of others does come off as believable in the scenes shown, making the image of the savage suitor in an actual gentleman's outfit so iconic for the past 25 years. The other characters are great as well. Belle's father is rather kooky, but can be occasionally adept and well-meaning when it comes to the castle's animated inhabitants and his daughter. Lumiere and Cogsworth also have a great comedic dynamic when their characters and actions bounce off each other. And heck, I can even see why people like Gaston so much. With him being pompous and full of himself and the appeal, comedy, and even drama come from this self-imposed larger-than-life mentality and a hairy chest to match. Even though you can see a leap in quality from animation from Mouse Detective to Mermaid, the animation in Beauty and the Beast, like any Disney film of the 90s, is fantastic, especially when it's remastered. Everything is well-crafted, the attention to detail and scope of Beast Castle is amazing, and characters, especially the Beast, move fluidly. It absolutely astounds me that after all these years, these films survive various transfers and benefit greatly from it, hardly looking that they show any age, before you realize that the only traditionally animated films that come to theaters are anime. The songs, while not suited to my tastes, are fine on their own. Except for the Gaston song. If you think that's not the best song in the movie, then you're wrong. There's no other way to put it. You're wrong. They are well staged and animated fine, even though the Beast's singing voice is kind of weird. She glanced this way, I thought I saw 
And when we touch, she didn't shut her at my paw. But I think it comes down to the film's pacing where my problem with the film lies. I feel that the relationship of Belle and the Beast, while developed fine as is, could be nurtured more, as the film doesn't really feel like it moves along, like Belle is spending a considerable time in the castle getting to like the Beast. Sequels and tie-ins be damned. In fact, I think that's the reason why people think this film has something to say about Stockholm Syndrome. As in something positive. As in, it totally fine, brah. But if one considers that Belle spends her stay from fear to sadness to bitching at the man beast child and falling head over heels for him, I think it all works out. I think in Beauty and the Beast's simplicity is a thorough retelling of the classic. While Gaston is intended to be taken as a villain in this movie, he serves as more of a complication rather than the absolute source of misery for the wilting rose plot of the film, with the Beast and Belle learning how to deal with the circumstances that are thrown upon them either by themselves or creepy b****s wandering the woods. The characters do come off as believable and likable, even when they're talking window dressing. Except for some. Wow, you didn't miss a shot, Gaston! <laughs> You're the greatest hunter in the whole world! Yeah, hi. What Tex Avery cartoon did you just walk out of? I recommend Beauty and the Beast for the appropriate fans of all fascination and ages. Behind its big narrative of the tale as old as time, there are these things that do make it likable and even sophisticated. It's like a proto-Frozen for the time. It was influential, it did impact a lot of the people that watched it, and it sits rightfully on the pedestal of the most beloved Disney movies of all time. It's not the most perfect film. I wouldn't even go so far to say as it's the perfect Disney film, but when it comes to great fairy tales, this one's a beaut. I'm Maximum Austin, and until next time, keep being confident, and you enjoy your day. And always remember to keep going forward.